My name is Chris Xie, the head of uh, open source strategy at uh, Futureway. I'm also the chair of the Shear Working Group at the Green Software Foundation. Today, my topic is advancing responsible AI, unveiling the software carbon efficiency rating for AI models. So sustainability in responsible AI. So we are on a responsible AI track. Uh, and sustainability is a key aspect of responsible AI. So what is uh, sustainability? Sustainability uh, ensures uh, the present needs are met without compromising future generations, especially focusing on the environmental, economic, and the social aspect. Now, what is green AI? So green AI focuses on the environmental aspect of the sustainable AI. Now we all know that uh, uh, there's a lot of need, energy need for generative AI. It is reported that by the end of 2024, NVIDIA GP uh, GPUs will consume as much power as all of the household in Phoenix, Arizona. An Irish data center, AI data center, consumes the amount of water to cool the AI data center that are equivalent to the annual water usage of two million US households. So how do we address the green AI challenges? So in our mind, we, have, we see this from uh, two perspectives. One is the industry or market approach. Uh, the other one is a regulatory guidance approach. From the market approach point of view, uh, there needs to be a demand, uh, awareness first, right? consumer awareness of AI environmental impact. And the second is there is a market demand for green AI. Uh, once we have awareness, then the, the customers demand for green AI solutions then sustainability becomes a good business. For all this to happen, there's a need for a standardization, need for uniform tool and standard. So from the regu regulatory uh, perspective, a standard uh, is a, a, a great tool uh, for uh, policy makers and uh, Currently, there is uh, no uniform uh, standard uh, for green AI. So there is a great need for standard, not just for uh, green AI standard, but also for the readings and the labeling system. These are specific tools that policymakers and regulators can make use of. And also, uh, it's very beneficial as well for consumers uh, to make well-informed decisions once uh, they have this uh, rating and the labeling uh, system. Introducing the software carbon efficiency rating for AI models. Uh, this is a working group uh, that was initi we initiated, initiated in the Green Software Foundation. And it is short for SCER. Uh, we pronounce it as SHEER. And that happens to be the pronunciation of my last name, SHEER. So, uh, what is SHEAR framework? It is a standardized framework that creates uh, 11 play playing field for AI models uh, to compete uh, based on their carbon impact. It's similar to Energy Star or Energy Guide uh, system for uh, consumer electronics. Uh, it is composed of very basic, four basic components, uh, categorization, benchmarking, reading, and visualized labeling. So who are the audience of the SHEAR framework? Who are the stakeholders? We consider the industry players, the big techs, who are producers of AI models, and also consumers of AI models, uh, plus uh, policymakers, uh, to help them make informed decisions and drive the industry towards green AI. 
a little bit more detail about the shear framework for AI models. First is categorization. So in our working group, uh, we are working together to help define what does it mean by categorization for AI models. AI models uh, categorizing AI models by their tasks, usage, size, or other characteristics uh, for, the, for fair comparison. Second is a benchmarking. It is intending to establish a standardized workload, test method, tooling and infrastructure uh, to measure the energy consumption and carbon emissions uh, so that it, the results and the ratings can be reproducible. Third is rating. What do you mean by rating? What, what is rating is composed of? So defining the rating range, the algorithms to compute the rating score. The lastly is the visual labeling, and this is actually the key part of this shear framework. And there is a lot of uh, other ways to measure benchmarking and things like that. But in order for this, this uh, carbon emission rating uh, thing going on, like uh, be more effective, uh, to be real, uh, it needs to have this kind of read, uh, the visual labeling, just like the, uh, you know, the Energy Star labeling system. A few months ago, I came to Paris for another conference, and uh, I want to bring some snacks for my daughters. I went to a grocery store and see a label like this. It's, a Nutri it's called a Nutri-Score. And uh, I was really uh, surprised, but also ha very happy to see this score, uh, this, this label, the full label, because it really helps me to determine what kind of food or snacks that I can bring home to my kids. This is very easy, right? A, I figure it must be very healthy, and E will be the, you know, very sugary and less healthy. And the shear framework is just like that, but it's for AI models. Just, just plain simple. It is, uh, the, the labeling is very important. It, it, it should be distinct, uh, simplistic, and easy to read. So if you click on the, the labeling, and the, the rating, and then you can see the details. Uh, it includes the rating, relative, uh, relative rating, as well as uh, absolute, uh, re, uh, the, the carbon emissions uh, per user, uh, there's software functions. And you, there's also QR code that allows you to uh, see the details of how these numbers uh, come about. So we also created uh, two uh, shear certification programs, two levels of shear certification programs. Uh, one is basically if an organization or an individual follows this four-step process uh, to come with the rating, and then they report their usage to our GitHub uh, repo, uh, report uh, the MD file, then they got awarded with the shared process conformance label or badge. And this is a similar concept. If you guys are familiar with uh, like open source uh, security foundation, they got the security label. If you follow the best practice, and you got that label for uh, your projects, open source projects. The level two is that if you follow this process and you also got uh, display your ratings uh, in your uh, system uh, publicly or, or in your product or services, and report it and uh, the, uh, the conformance on our uh, GitHub repo, then you award it with the shear reading conformance label. So uh, by the way, the shear is a draft specification. It's governed by the GSF process. So we welcome more contributors to join us uh, in uh, developing this uh, program, this project. It's an open source project. And uh, some sample use cases. So this is a website uh, called uh, uh, greencoding.ai. Uh, they quickly uh, implemented a shear rating uh, for one of their uh, requests. Uh, say the, uh, if you ask a question to a large language model, there's a response. And then along with the response are the detailed uh, energy consumptions, the uh, 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 copy emissions of that, requ uh, that request will cost, 
And also along with that will be a shear labeling. Like in this case, shear you know, is green, and it, it's supposed to be uh, uh, carbon efficient. Now I have a, a website. I can click on this website and see they actually implement it. Again, um, this is a demo. Uh, so it just demonstrates how they can make use of the shear reading program, the project, and the framework to help consumers of AI models to understand the carbon emissions uh, and the, their efficiencies uh, of their, you know, their actions or the, the emissions of the uh, large language models. A shares approach to green AI. So as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, looking at awareness. So we would encourage uh, more awareness and uh, increased awareness on the uh, environmental impact of AI. The second approach is that to standardization because the industry uh, at this time, there is no consensus yet on how do you benchmark, how do you categorize, how do you read, and how to display the readings. So this shared framework is an attempt to help industry uh, toward that goal, move toward that goal. The third is adoption. So once you have the standardization, standard uh, framework, uh, there is need to be integrated into AI lifecycle uh, in the uh, standard setting organizations uh, and be used in the regulatory tools. Can the, we can help enable those things to happen. And all of that would drive the impact the industry towards sustainable AI practices. The call to action to call you guys who are interested in this to, to participate and adopt uh, the shared framework. Uh, if you are the AI model hubs, please integrate share into your platform. Uh, if you are the AI consumers, uh, please demand the shared labeling for AI models. Uh, if you are a thought leader and developers, please propel and promote the shared standards into your ecosystems, uh, standard setting organizations, and the policy frameworks. Together, they join us in this green AI movement. We can help shape the future while AI innovation and the environmental responsibility go hand in hand. Now, oftentimes, people uh, think of this sustainability, uh, responsibility part of AI, uh, is an afterthought. So what we encourage uh, the producers and, and the consumers of AI models to have this go hand in hand rather than an afterthought so that together uh, we create a better future of AI. Uh, thank you, that's my last <laughs> slide. And feel free to get connected, uh, scan to connect, and uh, let's please join us in this green AI movement. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, next, I would like to invite my co-speaker, Therese Gale from Salesforce, to share with us how Salesforce leverage the shear framework in their AI journey. Welcome. Come on stage. Thank you, Chris. You essentially get two in one with this slot, so you're lucky. Uh, as a very brief intro, my name is Therese Gale. Uh, in my day job, I'm a strategic client architect, but I'm also a green code and sustainable AI advocate at Salesforce. I'm also assuming most people here probably don't know that much about Salesforce. So very, very briefly, I'll just set some context. So our sustainability story, where AI comes in in terms of our products, um, and then we'll delve into our sustainable AI approach, uh, how we're applying share to our AI models, um, and how these forces converge and why it's been so uh, crucial to partner with uh, Green Software Foundation and Chris as well. So, first things first, we believe business is the greatest platform for change, and we're strongly guided by our values, which are trust, customer success, 
innovation, equality, and sustainability. Sustainability is something that's close to my heart, and it's particularly proud, wh wh why I'm particularly proud to work for Salesforce. Um, and in terms of what we do on a product perspective, you probably best know us for um, our CRM products. Um, so we have a number of uh, clouds that which are essentially software as a service offerings. But actually, over the years, we've acquired a number of different uh, products. So we also have things like Slack, Tableau, MuleSoft, and so forth. Um, and in terms of our AI journey, from about 2014, we've started looking into how AI can help uh, enhance our products. And that started initially with productive, uh, predictive AI, but of course in recent years has shifted towards uh, generative AI as well. Which nicely brings us on to just how we uh, break down AI from our perspective, which essentially has three layers. Just again, to give you a little bit more of a context where we're coming from. So starting at the bottom, data, your AI-powered services, of course, will be useless unless you have uh, data that's relevant to your specific uh, use case. Model, we actually have a open um, model ecosystem uh, strategy. What that means is it doesn't matter what you, what, which model you want to leverage. You might want to leverage our Salesforce models, Maybe you want to bring your own, or maybe you want to use a third party. So for example, um, Anthropic or OpenAI. So we're playing nicely with all of those. Um, and then without going into too much detail, what happens in other layers, but essentially we want to do that with um, all the right controls. So think about privacy, how do you want to configure those? So that's where you see the Einstein Trust layer and Einstein One Studio coming in. And the last piece, of the, um, how we break, break it down is the user interface. So how do you actually interact with that um, AI model or LLM? So for us, we're embedding chat-like interfaces or agents within um, our SaaS products. So you can see there, maybe it's service cloud, sales cloud, and so forth. For the purposes of today, I'm just looking at some of our um, AI models. Um, but the goal is later we have transparency on all kind of models so that you can ha have uh, insight so you can better select. And that brings me on to how we think about sustainability and AI together. So there's essentially two sides of the same coin. One is how do we reduce the environmental impact of using AI? So it could be things like right-sizing models, shifting to uh, lower carbon intensity regions in terms of training those models and so forth. But the other side of the coin is how can AI be used for good? So what about the kind of sustainability use cases it can power, also investing in AI um, and so forth. Uh, just one thing I want to call out here as well, just to bring some of these to life. Um, so in terms of right sizing models, if you want our AI model to write code for you. You probably don't need it to write sonnets for you as well. So just really thinking about, does it need to be, um, you know, does it need to do everything? And in terms of just shifting to uh, regions that are powered by renewable energy, our own AI research team was able to reduce emissions of the training phase by 68.8%. So some of these things can actually make quite a big difference. So, Today, of course, it's all about transparency, and that's what I'm going to be delving deeper into. And transparency, if it's not already top of your agenda, it probably should be, because regulation is catching up as well. Um, so, for example, earlier this year, all um, EU member states unanimously voted for the EU Artificial Intelligence Act. It outlines a lot of things, for example, what kind of use cases are prohibited for AI models, but also it will, um, will, will ensure that creators, providers of AI models will need to disclose things like energy consumption, energy efficiency, and so forth. And this comes at a really good time because there is a problem around transparency. If we just look at last year, 80% of the leading AI models 
didn't disclose any or hardly any environmental data. So this is something, of course, we want to rectify. And for us, we you know, need to put our money where mouth is. So last year, we shared the um, emissions and further data on all of our models. I think one thing you'll notice as well is they're a lot smaller than maybe some of the big models, because again, they're built for a specific use case, but I'll talk about that a bit more uh, detail shortly. Also, if the carbon emissions numbers seem quite abstract, one way that I like to bring it to life is by thinking about how many trees you would need to plant, for example, to sequester a certain amount of carbon. So, for example, um, one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent gases roughly equates to 16 and a half tree seedlings that need to be planted and then grown for 10 years to sequester that amount. Just again, to, to sort of illustrate the scale of the emissions. And if you're wondering how does this stack up, so aggregate of all of those models equals about 74 um, uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. We've got three examples here. It's not to say that they're bad. Remember, these are general purpose models, and they're huge. They have so many more parameters. Um, don't know in detail how they've been trained, but it's just to like give you an idea of the different scales and the uh, corresponding emissions. So, to the meaty part. How are we collaborating? What does that mean for us? So, given our values and how important it is for us from day one to be transparent, and partnering with Green Software Foundation and something like Share is incredibly exciting because then we go, like, okay, let's actually look at how these forces can converge and we can do better, push the industry in the right direction. So, those four steps that Chris talked about. Step one, categorization. I've just chosen one of Salesforce's, uh, well, their, their models, which is CodeGen. CodeGen is actually open source, so you can find it on GitHub, it's on Hugging Face, um, very welcome to read the papers, it's, it's all there. And the reason why I've chosen it is, it's quite easy to understand what it does. It's basically uh, using text, it generates code for you. It's quite crucial for us as well. It powers some of our developer productivity tools. Um, so very, very useful. And um, yeah, it's, it's got a nice story to it as well that I'll, I'll talk about shortly. The second piece is benchmarking. So since we have the data for the training phase, it's quite easy then to uh, make a start on step two. And the third piece is rating, of course. So, heeding Chris's advice, I use the uh, approach of um, looking at the relative efficiencies and then giving it a rating based on that. And of course, the last piece is once we have you know, this all agreed, there's consensus on the steps, everyone's happy, we need to like, put those visuals be on GitHub, on our own sites, uh, blogs, and so forth. So, how does it actually look like? and to bring it to life, at least from our, our side. And again, this is a draft. I'm not saying this is the official. This is just to bring it to life um, and to show just for one set what it could look like. Um, so the way that it works, you can see different variants. Um, they vary by the model size, also like how they've been trained. So some might be um, uh, just trained in one language, some could be multilingual and so forth. And the way um, we look at the, uh, well, how to obtain the rating, essentially taking the uh, total emissions and dividing the individual emissions for a model by the total times by 100 to get a relative percentage. Um, and then you can see what those relative uh, ratings look like. The reason why I wanted to bring CoGen and talk about this is because actually sometimes more parameters doesn't mean better. So for example, for emissions, uh, it might be slightly higher, but actually it's not as bad as some of the, let's say, predecessors. And the carbon rating is probably one aspect that as a consumer you will look at before choosing a model, right? You'll look at other things as well. How does it work against different benchmarks? 
um, be it um, you know, custom benchmarks or the ones that Hugging Face uses. So actually, even though CodeGen has seven billion parameters, it outperformed its predecessor, which had 16 billion parameters. So I think that's, for us, quite a big le lesson, that more isn't, all, more isn't always more um, in terms of the data and number of parameters. So what's, what's next? This was just to bring it to life what it could look like. It started, we start, have, just by doing this exercise, We've started collaborating with many different parties. It's raised a lot of interesting questions. For example, how do we, um, what should the categories look like that are applicable to everyone across the industry, not just for us, because this is just more, if you, if you will, um, a first step just to bring it to life. But how can we then get it get across different stages? So that was for training. What about the inference stage? How can we, uh, if someone is choosing any model, how can you know, they use the same categories to compare Salesforce models against what else is out there. So there's similar, um, as I'm sure you've seen on Hugging Face, they display um, the energy that's essentially uh, required to run their six standard benchmarks. And there's talks now to like, okay, would it be amazing to integrate, share, or something like that within this platform as well? So that you have a third party who's running these benchmarks on their same infrastructure, so then you have that standardization and able to compare many different kinds of models. So, what's next? There was a whistle stop tour, who we are, why is sustainability is so important, why we care about transparency, why partnering with um, the share working group is so fundamental. And as I said, e even though this is a first step, by no means is it polished and ready and to be published, but it's already generating so many interesting and thought-provoking conversations that are leading to action, right? So for example, internally, just by having insight where industry is going, we're already talking with our product teams, like, okay, how can we embed this kind of rating into um, our product roadmap? Also, we want to raise awareness. So this is what's happening in industry, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's fully already adopted and embedded internally. So we need to do that socialization piece as well. And the third piece, which I think is incredibly, incredibly critical, is the external partnerships and giving back to the community. So collaborating with uh, an organization like Green Software Foundation is crucial. That's led to conversations with uh, other companies like Hugging Face, um, and one thing I didn't mention, but I think is equally important, is also advising governments into what should the regulation look like. So the EU AI Act, that, for example, is in its draft state. So again, uh, advocating for that and helping shape that as well. So with that, I'd like to say huge, huge, huge thank you. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but we might have two, two minutes for questions if there's any questions. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. So do you mean in terms of what the AI Act uh, outlines? Uh, yes, so um, it essentially sets guidelines around, for example, the kind of use cases that are prohibited. So, for example, if it's some kind of social profiling or social scoring or something like that, that's obviously bad use of a AI. So there's guidelines like that. It also sets out things um, in terms of the timeline. So once it's fully law, the you know within the first six months, those so if you're a provider of AI, you need to make sure that if you're in a certain category, you comply. And then it's sort of like um, cascading. So as you go down different categories, uh, the timeline, so let's say if you're low risk, in terms of applying, it'll be like two years down the line. Um, so to my awareness, it's in draft, um, but the EU states unanimously voted for it. So I think once it's approved, which looks like it'll be quite soon, that's when anybody in this space will have to make sure that they're compliant. 
similar to CS, uh, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. A lot of these things come, in, come from Europe, and it pushes the entire world, right, to uh, really think, okay, because, you know, even if you're just operating in Europe, doesn't matter if you're headquartered in the US, you'll have to comply. Yeah. Great question. At the back. Okay, the, let me uh, repeat the question. The question is about the rating range. How, who is going to define that, right? So that's the interesting part of the SHEAR project. So SHEAR is more like a is the meta standard. It's a standard of standards, meaning we can help. The SHEAR is defining a framework where the standards can be further developed. For example, your question about how to do define the uh, rating range, maybe rating algorithm. Uh, in the terrestrial case, uh, they're using the percentile, right? In other cases, maybe using letters like a Nutri score, like they're using letter A, B, C, D, E, right? And that's the range. Uh, so I just want to mention that SHEAR is a, a, a new project, is in its infancy. So if you are interested, please join us so that we can collectively work together to define the future of the SHARE project. So come join us. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Please. Do you have a Oh, your question is, is there a competitor to the SHARE project? Yeah. Oh, um, I'm not aware of an exact competitive project like this, but actually, I'm mentioned uh, to other uh, our colleagues and this is an open source project and in my belief system uh, there is no competition in open source project there is only collaboration in this open source project sure go ahead i think some companies or some organizations are thinking about it so that's why that convergence is so important because then it provides that openness transparency because again, if everyone's got different scale, different category, it's going to confuse the consumers. Like, how, how do you choose? Like, their green might be my red, right? So I think this is why even just starting to look into this has uh, brought to light conversations already happening internally at Hugging Face and with other um, players in the industry. So we, what we want is that convergence and there to be, it's, you know, apples and apples are being compared. Yes. Go ahead. The data. Yes. Yes. Okay. The question is, how do you do the benchmarking, basically? So. As I mentioned, we are at the initial stage of the project. What we're doing right now is to define the framework and define the definitions of what a benchmark is supposed to be composed of. Well, I mentioned a, a few, like you know, you compose a workload, uh, tooling, infrastructure, infrastructure, so that they can be reproducible. Right? We define this framework as to exactly. Are we going to use the ICI scores? There is an ICI score, if you know, software, Green Software Foundation. Uh, if you're using uh, kilowatt hours, uh, you're using uh, whatever algorithms uh, and whatever code that you're going to that is going to produce uh, that, uh, you know, the, the rating or the, the you know, define how do you define workload? Is it going to be, how are you? You're going to have this as a workload to a large model or my name is what? Something like that, right? How do we define the workload? That is to be defined during this process. At this time, we're defining the framework, defining the definitions of all this framework. And then we can go step further. It's so like a, a peeling onions, uh, one step at a time. Yeah. Is time? Yeah. 
Great. Thank you guys so much uh, for joining us. And uh, you guys are interested, uh, please connect with us. Thank you.